In this video, I'm going to write up solutions to part 034, exercises in plotting. As with all the exercises, I highly recommend that you attempt these before going through the solution video. Link to this document is in the video description, as well as all the other files in this video series. All the code that I'm going to show you on this video is going to work in Octave, unless I put a note up on the screen telling you otherwise. But most of it will certainly work just fine in Octave. All right, so the first section here asks us to uncomment the following, then customize the plots with colors, formatting, titles, labels of our choice. So basically just do whatever we want, and it gives us this starting code right here. So I'll uncomment it, and I'm just going to speed up the video while I fill in some miscellaneous colors and other things, just kind of arbitrarily. And this is the graph that I ended up with. It's pretty wild and a little bit miscellaneous, but that's just all I was going for there. I just want you to also practice some of your options. Feel free to play around. Continuing on down. All right, this is a multiple choice question right here. So assuming that I ran this code or had this as part of my code right there, I tried to put a title on my plot with the above code. What went wrong? A, B, C, or D? Need a semicolon at the end? No. Need quotes around the text in parentheses? Yes, that's the one. This will not run correctly unless we have either single quotes or double quotes around the text that we want to appear as the title. Wrong function name? Nope, that's totally fine. And should have created a variable? No. Also, that is that would be incorrect to do so. Continuing on down. So this exercise comes from the book MATLAB for Engineers, 5th edition. And again, we're going to uncomment the following code and fill in the blanks to determine the areas for all given combinations of lengths and widths. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of that comment and get rid of this one. And you see I've got some underlines to fill in down here. This is actually practice with mesh grid. I often find that my students need extra practice with mesh grid. I, I'm not sure why. People just have a hard time understanding what it does. I've got two vectors, lengths and widths and I want to generate matrices based on these lengths and widths. That's what MeshGrid is gonna help me do. It's gonna generate two matrices. One of them is gonna be filled with copies of the lengths vector. The other is gonna be filled with copies of the widths vector. The order does matter. If I have the length first here, well then I need to put in lengths here. And then I have width second, so I gotta put that vector name in second. Okay, so MeshGrid is gonna generate these matrices for me. And very importantly, if I just like multiply those matrices together, that will be an all combinations multiplication of the values in lengths with the values in widths, producing a new matrix with the same dimensions as these two matrices. Print this stuff out, use the size function, do whatever you need to do to investigate these variables if you're confused about MeshGrid. All right, so I've got all my lengths and widths, but now I want to display them out in kind of a nice chart. I would like the, I don't know, let's say widths to be lined up along the top and lengths to be lined up along the side. And then my results of, I mean, this is basically just a multiplication table. My results should be in the lower right of my uh, output right here. So let me put the widths up here. I'll put the lengths over here. And there is a transpose, and that's important because the lengths are going to be stacked vertically along the left column. The not a number is just a placeholder in the upper left corner. And then right here, we can put in the areas. All right, let me resize and then run this and hope it fits. Nope, what did I do wrong? Oh, you know, I got these backwards, actually. I actually wanted to put lengths up here and widths over here. It just depends on how you create your areas matrix, um, but that is definitely what happened. So I will be reversing those. All right, it did work, but I got to resize and rerun. All right, and there's my nice chart right there. It's not particularly large, but I've got the widths along the top, the lengths along that left column, and then my results, the areas in this uh, square or rectangle right there. Continuing on down. This next exercise also comes from MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition, and we've got some starting code to get you going, uh, and then we're gonna fill in the blanks and fill in the rest of it. This is another mesh grid practice. Um, I don't mean for these to be super hard, but I do think people need that practice using mesh grid. So in this one, I'm going to calculate volumes of cylinders with a group of radii and also a bunch of heights. You will hear me say radii or radiuses back and forth. 
I don't mean to be snooty about it, but radii is technically the correct pronunciation, but I accept radiuses, uh, language changes, and that's fine too, and everybody knows what you mean. So I've actually already got those two vectors plugged into mesh grid, and I've got my two matrices as a result right here, and then I need my volume calculation. Now I've got a note to myself that the volume of a cylinder is pi times r squared times h. So what I'm going to put in right here is pi, that's a built-in variable. Actually, let me get rid of the comment first. Pi is built into MATLAB times r squared. And I'm using the radii matrix right here. Great. And then I'm going to multiply element-wise multiplication. Use that dot star there, the same way I use dot caret here. Dot star times the heights matrix right there. And then I've kind of got a solution to the previous question. I've got my chart already set up. So let me change the window dimensions and run it and hope it fits. And it, it doesn't even remotely fit because of the font size that I'm using. But along this top column that gets wrapped around right here are my uh, radii. And then along the left column are the heights right there. And anyway, that is the table that I was going for. If you change your window size, uh, you might be able to see it. All right. So in the next example here, we have a bunch of graphs that are going to pop up, and they're separated using the figure command. So they're all going to show up on different figures. Let me run it to show you what I mean. And so here are these three figures that were created, and they're all on separate figures. But the instructions say that we would like them all to be on one figure using subplot. So this is just practice using subplot. So the way subplot works is before you do any plotting, and that is important, before you do any plotting, type in the word subplot, parentheses, how many rows and columns you want. We want it to be a three by one, so three rows, one column, and then what position is the next plot going to appear in? And I'm just gonna say it's gonna be in position one. Okay, great. We don't need figure anymore. But then, before we do the next plot, we wanna do subplot again. I just copied and pasted it. The only thing I need to change is this third number. I'm gonna change it to be a two. So in the second position of our three rows and one column, that's where this next plot is going to appear. And then same thing down here, we'll get rid of figure, and then subplot three rows, one column, third position, we'll put this last plot right here. I don't even need to close those other figures, right? I can just leave them up because I have this close all command right here that is gonna close all figures for me before this code runs. I highly recommend getting into the habit of putting that next to your clears and CLCs just to get you back to a blank slate before you run your code. Okay, so let's run it, control enter. All right, and there is my graphs right there. It's quite hard to read, but uh, you can always resize to see them a little bit better. Would have been better as I think one row, three columns, but you just reverse these two numbers and then that's what you would have. Continuing on down right here. All right, multiple choice. Subplot 322, the above command indicates what? Now I kind of just talked through this, so hopefully you can see it. So three rows, two columns, second position, which is going to be in the first row. So D is the correct answer right here. And I think that last part is probably the hardest part right there. If you narrowed it down to B or D, uh, you were in good shape. But subplot, like the positioning, actually goes left to right before going down to the next row, which is unlike most other things in MATLAB. Continuing on down. The plot function takes as input a vector of x values and then a vector of y values. The polar plot function takes what? It takes in first a vector of angles followed by a vector of radiuses or radii. So A is the correct answer there. Histograms. Use subplot to create a 1 by 3, so we did 3 by 1 last time, so 1 by 3 this time, figure of histograms, each graphing one of the following vectors of random data. Okay, I'm going to uh, speed up the video as I type out the code for this. All right, and here's my graph right here. And there's a little bit of an extra lesson associated with this. This is correct output. Now, yours might look a little bit different because there's randomness involved, but it shouldn't look very different. So I used three different random number generators very much on purpose. The first one, so data one right here, and that's our first figure on the far left. I just used rand. Rand generates random numbers between 0 and 1, and you see that on the x-axis here, not on the y-axis. The y-axis is a count of how many values fell into a particular interval, or bin. So the x-axis 0 to 1 is showing 
that rand generates random numbers between 0 and 1, and we generated 100,000 of them. So, on average, any individual interval of whatever width was chosen here, about 2,000 values fall into that interval. We can get more or fewer intervals by changing our histogram here, right? I could just say that I want 20 intervals and rerun it, and now I have a little bit fewer uh, intervals on that far left graph. And you can see the bins are a little bit wider. Not quite as wide as the middle, but still a little bit wider there. And also, most of them add up to around 5,000. The rand function is a uniform random number generator. All the numbers that are generated are roughly equally likely, which is why it's kind of flat on top. Same with the second graph. It's kind of flat on top. Rand i generates random integers. Now, the first input to this function is a 10. I'm generating random integers between 1 and 10 inclusive. And I'm generating 100,000 of them. The histogram function selected 10 bins for me, so each bin should contain about 10,000 values, which is correct. That's exactly what we're seeing here. Uniform generation of those numbers. Every number is roughly equally likely. Now, rand n generates random normally distributed values, a very different thing. The standard normal distribution is centered at zero, which we see in the far right graph, and the likelihood of getting values further away from zero in either direction, the negative or the positive, is decreasingly likely. The expected value is right in the center, it's zero. So a very different distribution, but a very useful one. A lot of data is normally distributed. It's a boring example, but I always use it. If you're throwing darts at a dartboard and you're aiming for the center, most likely the spread of your darts, the distance from the center, either to the right or to the left, or above or below, should be normally distributed. Now, one last note on this section. If you're doing this in octave, the command is just hist, not histogram. So it's abbreviated there. Continuing on down. This question comes from MATLAB for Engineers, 5th edition, and they're going to ask us to create a bunch of different graphs. So I'm just going to do these one at a time. First one is a graph of a circle. By defining an array of angles from 0 to 2 pi with a spacing of pi over 100, use plot, not polar plot. All right, we got to think back to our trigonometry class to do this one. So first I'm going to generate that vector of values from 0 to 2 pi. And then my x values are simply going to be the cosine of my angles. I'm using cos, not cos d, because I am in radians here. And then my y values are going to be the sine of those angles. It's actually not as hard as you might think. And then we are going to use plot and plot the x values and the y values. I'm just going to test this out before I even move on to the other requests. Great. There is our circle. If it looks more like an oval, it's because you need to like resize it slightly. It is actually a circle. All right, next part here. Use the g input function to pick up two points on the circumference of the circle. Just click as accurately as you can. All right, so that might not be the clearest of instructions. So let me show you how to do this. So I'm going to create uh, x points as the name of one variable and then comma y points as the name of another. And I'm going to set that equal to g input parentheses 2. I'm going to be able to click twice and get the coordinates where I click on the graph into these variables right here. x is going to be the pair of x values that I click on. y is going to be the pair of y values that I click on. And the 2 is telling g input, hey, you're just picking up two numbers. And again, I'm just going to test this. It's good to regularly test. Uh, we see the crosshairs there indicating I'm able to click. And I'll click here and there, and it displays out the points that I clicked on, and we could verify that that is correct, but I'm going to go up to the next part of the question here. All right, this one right here. Use hold on to keep the figure from refreshing and plot a line between the two points that you picked. So we're basically trying to draw a chord on this circle between the two points that we're clicking on. So first, hold on, and then plot, and I'm literally just going to plot the x points and the y points, and I think that'll do it. So I'm going to click there and click over here, and it draws a line between the two points that I clicked and also displays them out. Awesome. I think there's still more to this, though. All right, use the data from the points to calculate the length of the line between the points. Use Pythagorean theorem or distance formula, same thing. And then we should also display it on the screen, even though it doesn't really say that. So I'll do that as well.
All right, great. So there I was able to display my chord length right at that location. The instructions didn't say to do that, but I decided to do it anyway. And uh, I also displayed the text just at the first coordinate that I clicked on. Don't know if that's ideal, but that's what I chose to do. And I used your basic square root of the difference between the x values squared plus the difference between the y values squared as my distance formula for the length of that chord. And I actually provide that entire solution down here, which I totally forgot until I scrolled down slightly. But in case you got real confused on that one or I went too fast on the video, you can get all that information right there. And the text function, I think, is really handy uh, to use to display information on the screen. And you can learn more about it at this link right here. But that wraps us up for this exercise.